thank everyone for their attendance. Look forward to a good meeting today and uh, good things to happen. The first one is really a good thing to start out with, and uh, I'll let uh, Jim Spore make the introduction on the Ocean Front Fitness Park. You have a package in front of you. Jim, if you want to do that, please. Well, just very briefly, uh, really I'll introduce Doug Smith, who will introduce Luke Hillier, who really needs no introduction, but this is a great proposal that uh, Rosemary Wilson actually brought to my attention, uh, gosh, it seems like over a year ago now, a couple years maybe, and um, it's finally coming to pass, so. Really exciting. Okay. Okay. Well, what happens when you read Facebook once in a while? <laughs> uh, thank you, Jim. I think everybody in the room knows Lou Killier, but it's worth mentioning for folks that are maybe watching on TV, but he's the uh, chairman and uh, chief executive officer of ADS Incorporated, which um, you all know does um, uh, military equipment, first responder equipment, uh, logistics solutions, and employs hundreds of people here in Virginia Beach, and uh, so certainly a great corporate citizen. Today he's got his philanthropy hat on, and, and I got to tell you, they're gonna, he's going to show you something that staff is really excited about in terms of um, a concept that really fits with the the image and the the lifestyle that, that we are uh, creating and portraying here in Virginia Beach as one of the fittest communities, uh, frankly, in the country. Um, he's got a team that he'll introduce, but it includes um, not only uh, members from his Virginia Beach company, but WPL and SB Ballard, you know, both Virginia Beach companies. And so it's really a, a homegrown idea and a, and a real uh, generous uh, offer that he's going to make and uh, would like you to welcome Luke Hillier. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Thank Luke, you. Luke, we're glad to have you. Look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm Luke Hillier. I um, run a foundation called Hillier Ignite that I started uh, in order to give back to the community. So now I'm in this kind of transition years of my life. I'm really trying to give back to the, the communities that uh, have helped me to get where I am today and those that I care and, and love. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for your time. I know you're very busy, and I would like to also thank you for your service to our city. I know it's not always easy, but you do, and I appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a fitness park that my foundation wants to donate to, to the city. We want to make it a perpetual gift, so we're going to take care of the, the maintenance of that equipment as well. And um, I'll give you switch the... So how this all got started, it was a little bit over two years ago, I visited Santa Monica, California. And I checked in to, to thankfully, one of the, the nicest hotels there on the beach called uh, The Lowe's. Um, and when I was checking in, I looked behind the, the check-in and I saw these big screen TVs and they had on there people working out on the beach, you know, on fitness equipment on the beach. I was like, that's really cool. So I asked the, the receptionist, I said, Where's that located? I want to visit that while, while I'm here. She's like, this, this is right in front of our hotel. And uh, I went walked down further in the lobby, and there you go. I saw it right in front of the, the hotel is this, this very cool fitness equipment right on the beach. And uh, later on in the day, I made my way out there. I was a little jet lagged and, uh, and started working out. And I said, man, this is so cool. This is really cool. They've made the, the beach here in Santa Monica a, a park you know, an asset for, for the whole city to use. And I uh, got to know a few of the um, members of the fitness community because they're all working out there and they were really welcomed in. So it was a really cool place where, you know, both the residents and the visitors kind of came together and melded together. So we, we actually developed some great uh, relationships while we were there. But I'll show a short video here just so you can get an idea of what I saw when I went down there on the beach. I can picture each one of you out here already. Yeah. There's, There's those challenge. beers. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Where's the 
Where's the hockey party at, kid? Stop playing on that. That was John. Oh, yeah. 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 This is one of the more uh, the cooler pieces of equipment are our marquee pieces that rings. So I went out there and experienced that first, you know, myself, and I was just like, "This is really cool." So there was a few other people that were from Virginia Beach with me on the trip. I said, "Hey guys, come down here and check this out," and we were all just blown away and we ended up having a, a, a great workout and uh, like I said it was a really cool spot for the visitors or the tourists and the locals all to kind of join and, and bridge that that gap that is often there. Um, if you look here this is an aerial of the Santa Monica site so this is the location of the original Muscle Beach so in 1987, kind of Muscle Beach, Venice Muscle Beach was founded, and that's more of a weightlifting, you know, big cage uh, type of an atmosphere. This atmosphere, as you can see, is is really elegant. It's it's cool. It's uh, more focused on what people are doing today in order to achieve their fitness levels. So where we're proposing this is uh, right at 40th Street. One of the great things we think uh, of this location is it's at the end uh, of the boardwalk or at the beginning, either way, but it bookends Grand Park. So you've got Grand Park at one end, you know, great place for people to bring their children, you know, nice children's playground. And here what we're proposing is on the other end, a adult playground. I think it's a great location um, for many reasons. One, it's a turn natural turnaround point. So when people come and ride their bikes, or uh, run on the beach, they're already, you know, turning around there. So it's a kind of a, a nice transition spot. Um, it's also only a third of a, a mile from uh, public parking. So there's a city garage. It's only of a third of a mile away. And um, if you're into fitness and you're going to work out, that's not a detriment. A third of a mile is not a big deal. I mean, they'll probably sprint there. And uh, those who don't feel like sprinting, they'll walk or ride their bikes or run just like they are today. The other reason why I think this location is the, the best location for the proposed fitness park is it's, it's kind of at that intersection of where we've got uh, you know, all our visitors staying there, right, in the resort area and the north end. So the north end community can run down there, bike down there, walk there. They've got a lot of access to it. So again, as I talked a little bit about melding those, those community, uh, communities are bridging the gap between our visitors and our residents. I think this, this is a perfect spot for that being uh, that it's right between the north end and our resort area. Um, go to the next. So WPL, and uh, many of you know Billy Allman, uh, has uh, donated all his services. They're also the ones uh, who worked on Grand Park. So they've got a lot of experience working within on the beach and understanding the, the rules and regulations, how to plan this right. <coughs> Uh, they planned it uh, so that uh, the, you know, the beach equipment that's used for beach maintenance can get through the park and that this isn't going to provide any detriment to maintaining the, the beach location. We also um, plan on hiring the company in Los Angeles who made and manufactured the equipment and Santa Monica to do it for us instead of trying to go out and get the lowest bid or have somebody re you know come up with a new solution why not use who's already you know the company that's already been successful doing this this wants to come do it um, in Virginia Beach and SB Ballard who has uh, built the seawall years ago uh, in the boardwalk and was very successful in that uh, has agreed to donate uh, services installation services so the reason that's important is they've uh, they've got a lot of experience working down there so they understand uh, the the you know the challenging uh, area uh, that, and the requirements of, of building things on the beach and 
they're more than qualified to do that. So we've got a great and amazing team <coughs> that's already done work like this uh, on our team. Um, Virginia Beach, I think you guys probably have heard, but you know we were ranked uh, 15, number 15 as the fittest cities in the United States, and that was by the American College of Sports and Medicine. Uh, we were also ranked by Facebook uh, for uh, the, the being the fittest city. So I don't even know they did rankings like this, but apparently with their vast store of users and information, they started to do rankings. So that was uh, pretty cool to see us ranked number one. I think, I believe that this fitness park is going to solidify uh, Virginia Beach as a fitness destination. So we were already starting to get that... Um, for lack of a better word, vibe, or people are, are, are thinking Virginia Beach, thinking fitness, but I think this really solidifies that. And right now, if you're at the beach, you, know, you can run, you can bike, you can do those things, but having a, a bodyweight gym like this on the beach, I mean, it just increases dramatically the amount of different root exercise routines you can do and the diversity of the, the workouts you can do. And if you've ever had a chance to visit Santa Monica, I mean, it's a, it's a really cool place. It's a really special place. And if we were to do this in Virginia Beach, if you guys were to, to vote yes on this project, which I'm hopeful you will, then we'd be the second city that, in the United States to have something like this. So I think it just really puts us back on the map as being a cool, fit community. I believe that fit communities are competitive communities. And I know even in my business, this is going to create, uh, is going to be a great place for me to, to help us recruit talented executives. If I can take them to the beach for a beach workout, you know, they can stay on the beach at a beach hotel in the off season, which would be good for the, you know, the hotelers. But, and then provide them a workout on this equipment before they come into the office. I mean, I think the deal is going to be sold. They're going to be sold on Virginia Beach before they even get to our offices. So I'm excited about it, not only as a resident being able to use it, but as a business owner as well. And just to, uh, kind of wrap it up, Virginia Beach has been really good to me. I'm a product of the public school system. I went to Cox High School, uh, wrestled for them, learned you know, how important fitness was uh, at an early age there. And um, I raised a family here, an awesome family. And uh, I've grown uh, more than one very successful business here in Virginia Beach. And I, I feel I, I owe a lot to the city. And I want to give a gift back to the, the city and its residents. And I think uh, there's no better way to do it than this fitness park. Great. Thank you so very much. Any questions or comments? Rosemary? I um, just want to thank you for your vision and your generosity in bringing this to us. Um, I'm personally thrilled. Absolutely thrilled. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, early on, after I went to Santa Monica, I posted something up on Facebook. I said, wouldn't this be cool if we had this in Virginia Beach? And Rosemary is like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and she was one of, the, one of the, the first 500 likes. Jana? I'm going to beat the mayor to say this. It just has to be better than Santa Monica's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we've designed a very competitive park to what they, they offer. Theirs is probably bigger, so in the end, uh, if this is successful, but I didn't want to propose something that was so large that, uh, that it wasn't acceptable to, to everyone. So I think this is a good place to start, and uh, from here, I think uh, the limit is, uh, there is no limit. Uh, Amelia? Yes, I think this is very exciting, and if I told you not if, but what, when. Thank so you. I think we should do this. Thank you, Councilwoman. Other questions or comments? Luke, I just sincerely want to thank you. I, you know, I do want to see us be the number one fittest city in the United States, not <laughs> number too. 15. And I, and I think we can do that. I'm, I, I see that every day when I see people walking, running early in the morning and so forth. But more than anything, I really want to thank you for having a wonderful business or businesses in our city and truly making them community assets because your success has been great, but you haven't forgot about your community and giving back. And to me, that's really off the top greatest thing you could ever do and for that we sincerely thank you we look forward to getting this done thanks mayor thank you appreciate Luke. it thank you good to see you thank you all right we'll move along um the assessment and counter proposal on the proposed city council policy regarding constitutional officer compensation process john uh you asked to have this on and we put it on thank you very much mr mayor and i also don't believe you always hear me protesting about death by powerpoint and this was composed uh for the when we had our meeting last 
voting meeting in October when we had a manager's recommendation on the table, which the council decided to defer indefinitely, retain the status quo policy, which is each and every budget cycle, the city manager has to judge for himself whether or not he thinks um, constitutional officers should uh, have their pay adjusted in terms of the city supplement. And, uh, and so I think it's just like we don't ask the city manager to give us recommendations about how to change the salaries of people who work directly for us. We do that on our own. I think it does put the city manager in a bad spot to ask him to be deciding whether or not and how much the city should supplement the salaries of elected officials over and above what the state compensation board um, decides to pay and the general assembly decides to fund. Two different questions. And so I think we do owe the uh, appropriate head, and that's why I asked that night, did that mean by voting to defer, we are going to retain the policy in place, which makes the uh, city manager the good guy or the bad guy, how you put it in terms of how their salary supplements are adjusted each year. So what I'd like to do is rather than, on, I wait, is the keyboard over here? Because I don't want to go to every slide. Only to, you know, this up, I have to click. I just want to go to the actual slides in question. Because I don't want to repeat stuff that's no longer relevant in light of council's decision last week. It should take me to slide 10, but it did not. You want me to click for you, John? I just wanted to go to slide 10. But that didn't quite work like I thought. At least it didn't work like mine at work. I just want to go to slide 10. If I could. I think it's important to how are they set today? How did we get to where we're at today? The state compensation board meets on some basis, and they look at loca localities across the state. Often they'll either adjust it for size of budget or size of population. They come out with a number. For example, they'll say for city treasurer, 135, or the Commonwealth attorney, 145,000. And then the city steps in, and we add additional dollars and pay the benefits on that. For example, the Commonwealth attorney's package comes to $202,000 a year with the city supplement. It's about 148 from the state, so it's quite a bit of difference that we add. So, and then we decided, ah, <clears throat> we're not required to do that, but we do, and we have historically done so. But it's been a number of years since we have adjusted them in all fairness. I think the, the manager has kind of looked, I think, I won't speak for him, but he's tried to look at what his key department heads that have comparable types of executive positions, whether it's police chief or finance director, and has tried to sense a sense of balance. But as we all know, there is no labor market for elected officials because you have to live in the labor market. You're not going to be hiring someone from California. You're not going to, and if you want to go be the city treasurer in Norfolk, you have to move there. So it's not quite the same, but I understand the manager's situation of trying to look for comparability. So I just want to make sure that we all understood that. If you could go to slide 14, please. It reads, is there, a process, is there a need for a process? Well, I just have to, I have to click the other way. But when she, it's just not working. I don't know why this is different. If you would, that's all right. Just, just uh, 14 is blank. Yep. Right. Shouldn't be blank. May it just take the time to refresh. Well, the point here I'm trying to get at is, I don't think at this point in time, when you looked at the salaries that I shared with you in the packet, they're all quite competitive, I think, even if you take other things aside. I don't think there's a current need now to make adjustments, but I do believe the manager is right. We do need a process by which we're going to make those adjustments when we feel there is time to make an adjustment. My overriding principle is I think all elected officials, including ourselves, and it's true of congressmen, it's true of senators, it's true of governors, it's true of any elected official, and it's been a historical constitutional principle that pe that Elected office holders' salaries are not increased during the term of their elected office. That's not new to Virginia Beach. It's true of the governor. It's true of everyone. And I think it's a good thing for us to adopt in principle, for us to likewise say that when you run for office, if you're elected the city treasurer, you're elected commissioner of revenue, you know what that salary is when you take that office. And during the term of that office, that is the salary for that office, much like it is for council people. I think that's a good fundamental principle. What I'm suggesting as a way ahead, and not trying to take up more time than what is necessary, if you go to slide uh, 22, please. Oh, uh, 
that's not on 22. It's close, but it doesn't read the same. On <coughs> Uh, the one that says, what is your proposal? It should be... There it is. 26. I don't know why they got different numbers. Must be some blanks. Okay, it's just on the hard copy. I just did that. So what I'm saying is that we adopt an ordinance. I think that's to, to provide for a process. And that process would mean that in the year that the election is taking place, which in this case would be not in 16, but in 17, when we're electing the constitutional officers, that in that year, in that budget cycle, Mr. Mayor, that we would take inputs from those elected officials. We would hold some discussions with the community. We would look at that, and we ourselves would decide whether or not we wanted to increase the city supplement or not. It's a value judgment. I don't think you're going to go out and say, here's an empirical market. What the guy pays in Norfolk, what they pay in Portsmouth, really isn't relevant because no one can go to be the Norfolk, and Norfolk one can't come here and be our city treasurer. But if you look at the fact that people are paying money, <laughs> investing money to get a job, very few people are not saying, well, this doesn't pay enough. I think I want to quit. Labor economics would say that what are you making the adjustments for? But more importantly, though, you don't want to be a third world country and pay so long that people feel incentive to take bribes. That's always another concern in the dynamics of public compensation. But I do believe the more fundamental principle is not making those adjustments <clears throat> while they're serving their current term. And then we have our process. We adopt it in the budget. They have an election, you get elected come January of 2018, that's your pay. And that takes the city manager out of having to be that person that puts him in an untenable spot, I believe, to have to pass judgment on elected officials' compensation. And we can look, and maybe the fact it might be that the State Board of Compensation is a big boost, and we might find out four years downstream that we might think the supplement can come down. I mean, I think, but it puts that in our hands, and that really is the basis of my principle. The fundamental principle, no increase in pay during your term of office, and secondly, that the council takes away that responsibility from the city manager, which I think is the wrong place for it to be, and transfers it to us. That's the essence of my proposal. Um, I didn't want to go through all the slides, because I recognize you've got to build the agenda, but uh, that is it. I appreciate any thoughts and comments about how to do it differently or amend it, but I, I think it's a, a fair process. The one trick in all this, and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to be talking to some folks. There's one office that's elected for an eight-year term. You know who I'm referring to. And that is a little bit troubling. Uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I don't have, I'm, open, I'm open to suggestions. Please don't have to give them out, but your thoughts. But that is one thing that four years is one thing. You know, eight is another. So I, I'm not, I don't know what to do that. Maybe whatever adjustments we make in the four, we do the eight. But give me your thoughts. I'm looking for some general consensus, but I hope you all would agree that we don't want to put that burden on the city manager. I think he's looking for some direction. This is just something I'm proposing. That's all I have. Where, where do you want to go with this next, John? Well, I had scheduled it for a vote on the 17th. I'm, this is not time sensitive. Okay, well, let's, so let's I, just, so everything's I, in definitely deferred right now anyway. But I did want to have this done before we started, the, but so the mayor would, so the city manager would know in the budget process, this was something that he didn't have, or the, or the city manager at the time didn't have to address. So I really would look also for other people to suggest their comments, and maybe it's, but I'd like to, before we go away on Christmas break, to resolve this. Okay, put, here's my suggestion, and as you know, we've got uh, the recommendation by the city manager that's been indefinitely deferred, and we've got your recommendation and so forth. I would suggest if two people come up and want to recommend yours, his, both, or something else, then we put it on the agenda. And that's how I would like to leave it to you all to see if you can work out something amongst yourselves. If not, we'll just let it stay like it is. All right? Okay. okay. That's Thank Good. you very much for the time, sir. My, my pleasure. City manager's briefing now, Mr. Spore. Uh, Tourism Development Financing Program Amendment, Doug Smith. Doug, you're up again. How's that knee doing? He popped his knee over the weekend. Uh, it's, uh, what did my dad say? Getting old ain't for sissies. <laughs> um, let's see. Actually, maybe a little something there. Yeah, you're, you're a good man. Um, I mean, I, uh, as, as Barry's popping that up, I'm going to tell you um, a lot of stuff you already know, which is about the program that's in place, the Tourism Development Financing Program. And um, the General Assembly made some changes in the last session that um, uh, we think you all should consider. So I just want to talk you 
through that if you don't mind. Um, all right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to remind you of the, of the purpose of the program, tell you what your current policy that you all adopted in, in 2013 is, tell you what the General Assembly is allowing us to do if, 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 if you all are so inclined, give you some, some of the policy considerations that we've gone through the last few weeks as staff, and um, provide you with a recommendation. So you'll remember the program is really a, uh, it's a mechanism whereby cities in Virginia um, can take sales tax that's generated in a project and use that tax um, to go back into uh, the private sector for them to use for um, servicing their debt if there's a financial gap. Um, part of what you're trying to do, obviously, is fill a gap in the tourism offering in your community. And ultimately, and one of the things that, that I like about it is you're creating not only a partnership with that locality and the developer, but the state um, is also putting some money into the, into the project. Um, so you all adopted the current policy back in 2013 in March, and the um, criteria you put on, uh, we wanted it to be a significant project, so not a, not a small, you'll see some other communities have done smaller projects, but, but at, uh, in Virginia Beach, it's got to be at least a $30 million project. Um, you want to have some pretty significant sales taking place in the project, so it has to be at least a million dollars a year um, in sales, to, uh, in, in, in gross sales. Um, one of your goals, is, as it ha has been on all our projects, is trying to increase that year-round development, I mean, that year-round um, employment uh, at the oceanfront, um, obviously filling a tourism gap, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll show you the tourism zone that we adopted. It's been, it's essentially the resort. Um, but also we want to we want to know that there really is a gap in the financing and the private sector needs that that support and that help uh, that will help us avoid additional uh, public investment. Uh, the zone again, uh, essentially the um, uh, the oceanfront, the resort and the area around the convention center, the, the kinds of voids that um, are identified in our strategic plan for the re resort area include the dome site, a headquarters hotel, a, a uh, unique retail offering, um, a, a hotel flag perhaps that, that doesn't exist that, 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 that isn't in our, our menu today. Um, the process, pretty straightforward. Developer submits an application to the city, but you're, ultimately there's state approval here because it, it is ultimately a, a state and local program. So application comes in, staff takes a look at it, reviews it, tries to understand uh, initial fiscal and economic um, uh, impacts and, and really what's required. The development authority is involved, and I'll show you a graph that so, sort of shows how the money flows. So we brief the development authority um, at that process. Uh, at the same time, we're briefing you all. Um, uh, and then we come back and say, all right, if you all think this is a project that, uh, that, that has merit, then we'll run it, you know, we'll run it through the process, uh, bring it back to you. Ultimately, um, you all approve whether or not we submit, uh, we and the developers submit an application to the Virginia Tourism Corporation. And ultimately, it's the development authority and the developer that, that execute that agreement. Um, so you can see some projects that have uh, around the state, including ours, that have, that have started to use the program, still a relatively new program, but uh, the Cavalier Hotel uh, in Fredericksburg, and you can see a couple of smaller projects, the Hyatt Place Hotel, uh, Newport News over in City Center used it for some of their entertainment and retail that's been uh, some of the newer things that have come in over there. And then um, Norfolk has the, uh, the main of Maine, the, uh, the Hilton product in downtown Norfolk that's using it. Um, the current, so, the, so here's the, now we get into it. So here's the, the current ordinance is really about a 20% gap. So if there is a 20% gap that the developer says, you know, my pro forma will not support this, um, the, this amount of debt, then that's where we, that, where we would step in with this program. Um, each partner, the city, the state, uh, and the developer submits the equivalent of 1% of the sales tax that was generated in the project to provide the debt service on that 20%. Um, and so, Barry, you can kind of go in there. If you go, you'll see sort of the flow of funds here. So the developer has a project. Developer has to go and get his debt in equity to cover that 80%. Um, we come in, he also is going to go to the bank if he gets approved for this and get financing for that 20% gap that is supported by our sales tax, the state sales tax, and, the, and a 1% fee that the developer is going to generate. Obviously, that money flows ultimately to the state, and you'll see from the state that money flows to you know, our portion of the sales tax, the state's portion of the sales tax, um, the developers, you can keep going, Barry, the developers' 1% fee um, come back to Virginia Beach, do a couple more there. And then we flow, then that money ultimately flows over to the development authority to then be passed on to pay that debt. So if you can go on to the next slide, that'd be great. 
So what's changed? So the General Assembly came in and said a couple, really a couple of things. There, there's two tiers to the projects now. Projects under $100 million, which is the Tier 1. Projects over $100 million, which is Tier 2. Tier 1, what they've done is really pretty simple. They've increased the, 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 um, the cap for the gap uh, up, can go now up to 30% of the value of the project. And so um, then you know, you'll see in a second, same sort of parameters, 1% from us, 1% from the developer, 1% from the state to fill that 30% gap. And um, tier two, a little bit different, bigger project, needs to be of what they call regional significance in, from a tourism perspective. Uh, the gap still stays at 20% on the larger projects, but we can put in, uh, the three partners can put in 1.5% instead of 1%. A uh, couple of key things there. What that really does for the developer is it pays that debt off faster than obviously if they're getting 1%. So that's less interest that, that they're going to pay. The, the, the catch here for us is, you know, we only get 1% of the sales tax. So we've got to find that extra half a percent somewhere else. So that's a, that's a key piece. Um, uh, excludes uh, retail, um, all retail projects, 100 percent retail projects, and um, ultimately the uh, the application is going to go to the Virginia Tourism Corporation, and they're going to say, all right, does it increase hotel taxes? Does it create jobs? Does it get out of state visitors coming that wouldn't otherwise be coming? And, and does it have a significant fiscal impact? So here's what we'd ask you to, to consider. We, what you're seeing, and you all know this better than I do, but the reality is the development, we're really talking about the oceanfront as a practical matter for the, for the resort, for this tourism zone. Um, oceanfront development's expensive. It's expensive because you've got tight um, uh, confines, you've got poured in place concrete, you're talking about high rise buildings. One of the dynamics, and John will appreciate this better than most, is everybody wants an oceanfront room. So you've got to have all those rooms facing the oceanfront, which catches you on some of your efficiencies that you can do with some of your elevators and corridors and things. So it ends up being a single loaded uh, structure. The reality is uh, redevelopment's expensive. Y'all have heard me say a, a lot now in the last year and a half. Redevelopment's expensive. And redevelopment of the oceanfront is expensive. And um, that limits people's motivation to take down some of these older products and put up new products. And, and the reality is when that happens, it's, it's good for everybody. Um, assembling land, we've, we've seen this time and time again, but assembling the land uh, can be expensive and, um, and challenging. Um, one of the things that we are, you know, really interested in and what's really happened these last few years and I think will continue to happen, we're seeing um, some premium flags that have not been in the marketplace that bring a higher demographic and a completely separate, you know, as the Hyatt's coming in, that's a whole new reservation system and a whole new uh, level of demographic for our visitors and guests. And so that's, that's a positive. Um, but I think you've got to, I think most of the hoteliers would tell you when it comes to financing, we're, we're still a, a B market. And that, and that getting financing for a significant um, a, a product that we want to have is, is challenging. One of the things that, that we like about the program, again, I said this earlier, is it's that access to some state money. So, you know, we're for the, for the right projects, you know, we're certainly putting local uh, investment in there. But this is a chance to bring some state uh, investment into those. Um, so what we would say to you is, um, uh, obviously, at the top is your current policy that I already ran through with you of, of sort of the dynamics you all wanted or the criteria you all want in place to, to move forward with the project. Our recommendation is really the, the second two bullets, which is, you know, keep that $30 million threshold. But if you're going to go to 30 percent, it, it ought to be even bigger. So we think that's that 50 to $100 million kind of project. So one, it's a big project that's, that's got some significance. Um, from 30 to 50 million, we'd stay with the 20 percent. If you get in that 50 to 100 million, we think we should have the op option of looking at going to the, that 30 percent gap. Um, if you, we want to, we want significant jobs, and we're and we're and we're saying let's put a number on it. Let's say it's got to be at least 50 jobs, uh, full-time equivalent jobs that pop up. Uh, it's redevelopment. Um, and again, that premium flag that fills a brand. So we're not saying you have to do all those things, but to the extent that it, it does these things at the top, it also does a couple of these things at the bottom, then that merits consideration to move to that 30% gap. 
on the tier two program, I, I would tell you we've been back and forth on this. And, and um, this is the over $100 million project uh, to go from uh, 1% to 1.5%. And the, what, what um, the reservation we've had is that extra half a percent, we've got to find somewhere else. So it's not like it's money that, that's being generated necessarily in that it's project. coming from that project specifically, correct? Our half a percent, correct. Correct. We're getting that one. We're getting one percent because we don't get but one percent of that, that sales tax. Um, and, and I got to tell you, time we were contemplating coming in here and saying, let's just let's don't do that. The recommendation really, though, is go ahead and amend the program to allow allow you all to do that if you want to. And if the right project comes forward and we have a we will find the right funding source for it and give ourselves that option. So if you flip to the next slide, Barry. The recommendation is amend the current policy to include the, the changes that the state has allowed us to make uh, for projects that meet the criteria um, that we laid out for you. And if you go to the next slide, I think it does. Yeah. So we would say, uh, obviously, following your guidance, um, uh, recommend amending the policy. Give us those options. If you agree, we would prepare an ordinance uh, to bring forward to you, Dana Harmeyer and uh, Patty Phillips and uh, Ron Berkebaugh. There you know, Ron Berkebaugh has really been carrying the water on this and spending a lot of time uh, working through what we would bring forward to you. Um, I would tell you this, there, there are projects out there that are waiting to see what you all do in terms of coming forward. So I think it's very possible that uh, we'd have a project or two come forward uh, in pretty short order. Um, so we think we all could adopt this as, as soon as your next meeting, or we'll, we'll follow your guidance on when that could happen. So thank you, Mayor. Rosemary. Okay. So when you say we ha we'll have to find that half a percent, mm -hmm. what are some of the places that we go to find that half yeah, a percent? Yeah, it, it, it's. I think we, it. That's the reason we were a little we were a little reluctant to put it in there. We said, you know what, in, in this environment, it's going to be hard, hard for us to find that half percent. And so, however. You know, as a project comes forward, if you all look at it and say, boy, this thing generates some pretty significant revenue for us over time. It doesn't happen to come from sales tax, but it comes from room tax or admissions tax or whatever that is. We'd have to look at that project and see what the revenue streams are from that project to be able to come in here to you all and say, you know what? It's worth going to that half a percent. If we go to the 30 percent, do we have to put up the one and a half percent? You don't have to do anything. Correct. But, but could I? Yeah. Because... I think this is a good question. It, I'm trying to visualize what we would do right now with a specific project. Sure, sure. Could I ask you to provide council with an example of something that perhaps you would recommend? You know, here's this $125 million project. Okay. Here's what the revenues and so forth will be generated in. This is where we might be asked for that half a percent, and here's how you would make your decision. I mean, sure. I, I, sure. I guess I'm trying to figure out how to make the business decision that would, you know, say do right. it. I'm, right. So I, I'm, it's a great question. And I think the thing is we don't have to do it, which is fine. But I, I sure would like to have an example of, hey, here's what the investment would be. Here's what the bottom line revenue would be after half a percent for X many years or something. Yeah, and you're really talking about the overall. You're, you're, the 20%, you're 30%. You're, I'm, I'm, you got, I'm talking got, about the yeah, one and a half percent. I got it. I got it. And, and I would tell you about. right now, we don't have a one of those over 100 million quote in the queue, but there's some of them swirling around. So I can get you, I can work something up for you that, that lays really out what that might that. look like. John, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just had it on my mind. Uh, on, <laughs> on slide 12, if you could go back to slide 12. You know, my position has always been we should never be taking any money from the unrestricted general fund sources to be subsidizing anybody's project because that means we're basically indirectly raising taxes on citizens indirectly to pay for a project. So I just make my so I'm not really enthusiastic and can't support even that part. I'm not even sure about the whole thing. Uh, but I am concerned about this job piece. Okay. Because... 50 full-time equivalents is not the same thing as 50 jobs. Okay. And I think we, and if we're, one of our concerns is we have certainly in the region among the lowest average private sector weekly wages in Hampton Roads, as you're well aware. So we have to be asking ourselves when we're making these kind of commitments, you. you know, what is, that criteria is, I think, too vague. 
we should have specifically something down about the real number of full-time jobs or some kind of matrix in our mind and some kind of matrix to see what the real salary composition is looking at these projects. Are these people who can afford to live in our community? Are we taking on additional costs? They then come down here and tell us, gosh, our workers can't afford to have any place to live. Our workers can't afford to get to work. You need to build this mass transit to come from Chester. So we build one demand signal but create another that never gets captured on the other side. So I do think we need to have all the externalities of these projects captured. Look at what we've gone through with the arena. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of gives you an indication. Uh, I, I don't sense we've had that kind of thoroughness on other projects, and I could mention some. Um, so I think that's a part we have to have. And also, there's no discussion here about what's the level and degree of cannibalization that we're willing to tolerate with a project. We know when we did the Cavalier project, they told us that the initial first five-year projection, 75% of those revenues would be cannibalization revenues. So at some point in here, we have to understand that to know whether or not we really are favoring one business over another through a subsidy arrangement, or in fact, are we really generating net benefit that makes the amount of substitution that we do have, or displacement, depending on the terms of your choice, right. acceptable. And if that's not in that policy consideration, we could be making what looks on the surface some very, because it's more glitzy, but underneath it's a very corrosive and undermining businesses elsewhere, and the, the net benefit is the revenues flowing through the general fund do get degraded because they're flowing there and there's a net loss. So I'm more concerned about the rigor of the business analysis and the criteria by which we'll evaluate the proposals and the overall threshold because that kind of, that's, that's the easy part. But if you don't put these other parts in, you're really just leaving out there because we have shown a predilection to, to throw it up against bad deals, and you only have to look at that hotel in Norfolk. I know that's in your package, but I have yet to meet anyone in the sane world of business analysis that says that was a good deal for the taxpayers of Norfolk. And so I think if we're going to bring this forward, Mr. Matt, this has to come forward with a lot more on the policy aspect of how it's being applied and the criteria by which the projects would be evaluated for me to warm up to this. I think this has the makings of... Uh, bad investment decisions, and we're, we're buying something with too much uh, ambiguity for my comfort. Thank you very much. Shannon. But just to clarify, this just gives us the right to be able to evaluate those projects going forward and right. not saying no, right? Yeah, two, we can uh, come uh, up with the criteria that if we want to make sure they all fall in bucket A versus bucket B. We can do that, but this has just given us that right, correct? Correct. And there's two things that, that I think um, that you're exactly right. So each one of the, the um, you all maintain control. Nothing gets approved that doesn't come to you all first with that, that kind of analysis that Mr. Moss is looking for. The other is, and I glossed over this too quickly, one of the things we're, we're going to have in place is a, a third-party evaluation. And Patty and I have been talking a lot, and we've got some folks that are, that are helping us now to look over our show. I think Patty and Paul Harris and those folks do a dynamite job on their fiscal impact analysis. But we also want somebody that's, that's seen other deals in other markets to be looking over our shoulder at the same time before that comes to you all. So we'll have both of those things in place. So I, I, I think the rigor comes at, I, I hear what you're saying, the rigor comes from the project by project analysis in, in this proposal. I disagree. Okay. I think what we have to have is thresholds by which if it doesn't meet these thresholds, we're not even interested in entertaining the idea and sending that market to the, send that signal to the marketplace so we don't get ideas that we know we will not accept. There's a difference between the trade space, between what you'd like to have in a perfect world, and what the minimum you'll accept, the threshold. But we ought to have some consensus about some threshold of job creation, some threshold what's 50 or 100, some threshold about the pay, some threshold about cannibalization of which we are not interested in something that has 50% cannibalization over a 10-year period of time. We're not interested. So you don't consume your time looking at deals which don't fall within your policy parameters and you only look at those that meet your above threshold requirements. That is is different. This sets and doesn't set any threshold parameter requirements. That any deal is a potentially good deal and that's not true in any business. So we can't go in with blinders on. We've got to keep our eyes open and if something might fall 1% out of our threshold, it might still be a really good deal in the end. I mean, we've got to be able to look at that on each project's merit and figure that out, I would think. Well, I don't know any big business people who just look at every proposal that comes in. Great comments. Yes, ma'am, Amelia. Just asking a little bit more on the third 
bullet where you have the uh, fill a brand gap, mm -hmm. especially like how we have at the town center, there's certain retailers mm -hmm. and certain caliber. We're not putting just any. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little yeah, bit Yeah, so, so, so part of what we're talking about there is that, that, that premium flag is sort of a term of art in the industry of, of uh, again, um, something that may not be offered in the area. So when you bring in a, um, let's say we didn't have Marriott. If you brought in a Marriott product to your community, that, that, then you don't have Marriott today. That's a, that's a reservation system and a reward system and a um, level of customer that didn't come into your market. So in our case, that's been Hyatt historically, and there's some other brands. So, so one of the things we're saying is if somebody brings that, that premium flag that doesn't exist today that, that broadens that, uh, that offering at the oceanfront, then that's the kind of thing we ought to look at. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Doug, what I would suggest, you picked up a few comments, yep. but we do want to move forward on doing something with this in the near future. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <coughs> I'll now go to City Council Liaison Reports as I look across the table. Well, I have two little ones. Um, yes, ma'am. Ernestine Middleton, who was a longtime um, member of the library board. She passed away and had her funeral yesterday in fact September they had just given her you know her award and plaque and she had planned to move on so she passed and the second trying to think oh yeah planning council as you know uh, Susan Perrier she will resign effective July 2016 so they're going through the process of looking for a president but now they want to add the word CEO to it too so those Great. are two big ones. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, the Minority Business Council is having their um, conference and expo celebrating the 20 years. I'm looking um, forward to that. On Thursday at, I think it's at noon. We have to be there at 11, but uh, it's at noon on Thursday at the Convention Center. Or, no, Weston. No, Weston. Weston <laughs> Town Center. Sorry, at the Convention Center last year. Um, and then Saturday, Doug, Doug, I don't know where. Right behind you. Oh. Doug came out with me, or Sunday, I guess it was. Uh, we did a We Feed Virginia Beach pilot program. Uh, where we drop bags in a particular neighborhood in the Rose Hall District on people's doorsteps, and we've been partnering with the school system to feed the hungry kids within the city of Virginia Beach in their backpack program. So we distributed all the bags on Sunday. Saturday, we're going to go back and put more flyers on the doors that says, don't forget we're coming tomorrow to pick up your food. And then we're going to go back on Sunday and pick up the food. So we had, I don't know, 20, 25 people out Wonderful. Sunday doing that. And we're going to be doing it again Saturday and Sunday from 9 to 1 or 9 to 11 if you want to come help, hint, hint. And, um, yeah, so we're hoping to accomplish something with that. Thank you very much. Any other liaison reports? Yes, sir. I uh, met with the, uh, the MEDAC group, and we had a presentation from Scott Philpot, the executive director of the Cybersecurity Roundtable. Uh, he informed us of all the initiatives that are occurring right now uh, within the cyber, uh, as a result of the Cybersecurity Roundtable, um, and, and it's very fascinating stuff, and it's a very high-growth industry, so it's, it's fascinating. Very good. Any other liaison reports? I'll now move to council comments. Yes, sir. I know all of you probably have been following the uh, Bipartisan Budget Act. I just thought I'd give you, since I live and breathe this stuff, I thought I'd just share you the big picture of where that's going. Since it's a big part of our economy and it should be, in, it should be injected into our five-year forecast. But for 16, FY16, the year that we are in, the under the Budget Control Act that we were operating under, the top line for defense was $523.1 billion with a B. Under the proposal, which is now being adopted, it will be $548.1 billion. That's a $25 billion increase. But the increase in 17 over 16 is only $3 billion. And that's still, that number of 548 is still $3 billion less than the president proposed. But it's still greater than what we had. Slightly greater than what we did this year, but... It's not as much as people have been thinking. That's why I'm just trying to point out. It's not when you really get into the details, and I'm sure that our lobbyist hopefully is, has more time to do research than I do on my free time. And then on the, non, on the discretionary side, there was a likewise a $25 billion increase. Remember, it was $80 billion over two years, 40 for each side. So that means it's, the expenditures are front-loaded in 16, and in 17 they're much smaller. Uh, so that leads, means lower stimulus on the government's part. 
the, but interesting, the domestic spending, I'll call it, is only about $40 million higher in 17 over 16. And why this is important, all the funding that goes into transportation that comes from the general fund, because they have to go in there and supplement in part because of the large transfer to transit from car taxes for roads, that expenditure, which is not trust fund related, counts against that cap. So there's a lot of things that count against that cap, which will cause a much lower growth rate, if not in some cases negative growth rate in revenues from the feds to localities in 17 over 16, just because of the index of inflation and how those benefits are calculated. So that's something that uh, is not a rosy picture. And likewise, I would say uh, defense spending and purchasing power <coughs> term is flat to slightly negative. So that will be certainly a, a factor. Two other things that were in this act which greatly influence our locality is that the uh, – you remember Dr. Cook talked about in the early days how we had tremendous growth in income, per, per capita income, even though the private sector was flat because of the tremendous increases in Defense Department uh, pay. Well, that is not true going forward. In fact, it was 1.3 percent in this budget, and at the same time, over a five-year period, the BHA is reduced by 1 percent each year. So you have a compensating factor. So as we're looking at our five-year forecast, we really have to be a little bit more dynamic and insightful on as we model what we think growth in household income is over what we have traditionally projected. It is a significant, though subtly building, change in income and cash flow. And and when you look at the procurement money, which is substantial, all that procurement construction is predominantly in Newport News. And, I don't, and I've never seen the employment pattern, but that would be an interesting thing to ask, ask the Hampton Roads District Planning Commission when they do their economic analysis, what is the employment distribution of the shipyard? Is it predominantly a peninsula west, or how much is that? Because those dollars likely will less likely flow to the south side, and we'll need to take that into the calculation as we see not only how much money is, but where it's being spent. And that's slightly different. But that's all stuff that's publicly available when you look at the congressional testimony. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Any other city council can on the spend? Um, yes. Um, um, I have uh, asked Rod uh, to put together um, a resolution um, that I'm going to pass around to everybody that I hope that everybody will agree to support. Um, it's a resolution supporting legislation for, uh, for Virginia to participate in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that Ron Villanueva is proposing. Um, I want to pass them out to everybody and give everybody time to look at them, uh, make any notes that they want to make, and I hope that everybody would agree to uh, be a patron of this. All right, I'll ask people to get directly with you before our next meeting if Great. they have questions. Okay? Great. Got all right, Council? Any other City Council comments? Hearing none. We'll move on. I have a vision. Let's see if it comes true on the agenda. Let's see if it does. It's up to the vice mayor to make this happen, of course. <laughs> what kind of vice mayor are you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Under ordinances, uh, anybody have any comments on any of them? Yeah, I'm voting no on 3B. The That's just consistent with my position for the beginning on that project. Anything else? Anybody else have any comments on ordinances? Good. Good. All right. Planning, Mrs. Henley. Um, I'm going to pass around this um, proposed uh, shift in where this uh, tower will be on this property. Ex uh, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. I've got to get back to ordinances. Under number two, the... For Jimmy's professional baseball, I'll be abstaining on it. Please. Two. Yeah. I'm sorry, Barbara. Uh, this property uh, did have, and if you look in your agenda at uh, page five of the aerial of site location previously, the, the property was so narrow in the front that it really didn't have enough width to keep the impact of this tower fully on this property, it shifted to others, and I asked them if they could shift it on the property so that it was more fully on the property in question, and in working with Mr. Walton and the company, they have come up with this, which um, just moves it back, and when you see the pro uh, proposed Drake's Mill Road, that's London Bridge Road extended, if and when it's ever built, you see that 
but it would be closer to that than it would to any um, uh, housing and so forth that might potentially be built. I think this makes a better possibility than having it next to an adjoining property that uh, would be impacting the, the neighboring property. Of course, this also gets it considerably farther back from Princess Anne Road, which would, I think, make it a better uh, visual for, for that particular area. So if so that's okay with everybody? Yeah. As a okay. minute? Uh, and the applicant's uh, fine with that? Oh, yeah. See, he picked the spot. And, and I got to go back to Mr. Jones. I apologize, Council. Under 4 um, A and B, uh, those encroachments uh, will be abstaining as well. Please. So you're okay with this now as amend as the uh, plan yes. is amended. I is think this is right? much better for um, that property owner as well as the adjoining property owners. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Mayor. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by section two point two dash three seven one one eight code of Virginia as amended for the following purposes public contract discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds and discussion of the terms or scope of such contract where discussion in open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A29 arena. Publicly held property, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2 dash 3711A3 Beach District, Beach District. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration of or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining or resignation of specific public officers, appointees or employees pursuant to section 2.2 dash 3711A1 council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Call the roll, please. Family. All right. 